Hi everyone, welcome to today's LACNETS webinar, How to Ask For, Accept, and Get the Help You Need with Kim Hamer. I'm Lindsay Judovine, the Director of Communications for LACNETS, and this is... I'm Lisa Yen, I'm the Program Director for LACNETS. Before we get started today, I'd like to take a second to thank Rich at TVP Live for making today's webinar and high quality production possible. You're the best, Rich. We will be having a live Q&A following Kim Hamer's presentation, so to submit any non-case specific questions for today's speaker, go to www.slido.com and enter event code LACNETS. Also, here are a few tech tips for today's webinar. For your audio, be sure that the volume is all the way up on, on your computer. Also, double check that the volume is unmuted on the webinar broadcast screen. For your video, you can enlarge the webinar broadcast screen by clicking the expand screen button in the bottom right corner. Also, the full webinar video will be posted on our LACNETS YouTube channel within the next few days. You can find that at bit.ly slash LACNETS YouTube. Also, you can find 100 plus net videos from our past meetings and conferences. Also, be sure you're following LACNETS on social media. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram with the handle at LACNETS. As a quick reminder, these webinars are done for educational purposes only and not substitute for medical advice. Please talk to your medical team if you have any questions or concerns about your individual care or treatment. We all have our own opinions and these are our own opinions. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of LACNETS. And now I'll pass it off to Lisa. Thank you, Lindsay. As you know, LACNETS stands for the Los Angeles Carcinoid Neuroendocrine Tumor Society. Our mission is to provide education, advocacy, and support for all people impacted by this rare disease that used to be known as carcinoid, an old term meaning cancer-like. The more accurate term is neuroendocrine tumor, or NET for short. You'll often hear us say neuroendocrine cancer since we understand NET is a type of cancer and not cancer-like or benign as previously thought. While you often see Lindsay and I leading the meetings and programs, we are led by a team which includes our interim administrator and board member, Kavya Velagapudi, and board member Donna Gavin, who is also the sister of Lactitz founder and executive director emeritus Giovanna Joyce Mbasi. Our newest board member is Mary Dunleavy, who is living and thriving with NET. I'm excited to introduce today's speaker, Kim Hamer. Kim is a professional speaker, writer, and mother of three beautiful children who sadly lost her husband to cancer. I heard Kim speak at the Cancer Support Community in West LA back in 2016, and her talk had a deep impact on me. She shares her experience with such warmth, vulnerability, and humor that I laughed and cried while learning so much from her insights. I felt like she was able to put into words some of the things I was feeling but didn't have the language for. She also puts organizing help and communication into a context that makes it easier to handle. Because she cares about showing others how easy, simple, and impactful acts of love are, Kim wrote this book, 100 Acts of Love, A Girlfriend's Guide to Loving Your Friend Through Cancer or Loss and launched her website, 100actsoflove.com, with a mission to help people and companies to act with confidence when cancer strikes. I found her book to be hugely helpful and have a copy myself, which I purchased back in 2016. And I'm excited to share that LACNES is offering a special gift to a limited number of participants, a complimentary copy of Kim's book for the first 50 people who watch today's webinar and complete the survey. You must have registered in advance for today's webinar in order to receive the link for the survey. After completing the survey, you will receive a special code that you can then go to Kim Hamer's website, 100actsoflove.com, to receive your free copy of Kim's book, 100 Acts of Love, that she will sign and mail to you. So now I'm thrilled to welcome today's speaker, Kim Hamer.
Thank you, Lisa, for that introduction. I so appreciate you, and I'm really happy to be here. Um, as Lisa said, my name is Kim Hamer, and I am what you might call a cancer caregiving expert. Um, I help cancer patients, caregivers, friends, employers figure out how best to support a person with cancer. So today, we are going to talk about how to ask for, accept, and get the support that you you need. Um, I'm going to cover a couple of, going to cover it in three separate buckets. So we're going to talk about five common blocks to accepting help. We're going to talk about how to accept help when you need it, because you don't always need it. And we're going to talk about the plethora of help that is available to you that most of us don't even think about. Um, but before I jump in, I kind of want to take a moment to talk about my personal experience um, you know, associated with cancer. And what I want to talk about is, you know, when you're what I call a cancer muggle, someone who doesn't understand the cancer journey and all its complications, cancer really has like three main emotions. It has sadness, it has the, the pity factor, and like this sense of fierceness, like strength and courage, raw. And then you get into it and you realize that the journey is way more complicated, right? It has, you know, you're dealing with fear, anger, despair, you know, joy, connection, fun, um, relief, you know, worry, um, all these emotions. And so as we go through this deck today, I want you to just sort of remember that everything I talk about is going to sit on this bed of massive amounts of emotions. So some of the things I might say might really strike a chord with you and you may think, oh my gosh, that's so stupid. And some of the things I say might really, might really resonate with you. And then you're going to come back and watch this recording two days later and different things are going to resonate with you. And that's because as you all know, cancer is complicated, right? It's complicated physically and it's complicated emotionally. All right. So I want to talk a little bit about entanglement. You know, when I think when we usually hear about cancer, we think it's the battle, right? We, he beat cancer. He lost to cancer. He lost the battle. And what I realize is cancer is like this entanglement. It's this enmeshment, right? And so it reminds me of Christmas lights, that ball of Christmas lights that you take out every year if, if you celebrate Christmas and you try to get it untangled. And so you're working at getting it untangled and you're almost done. And then you find out that, that this other part is tangled. And, and so it's this entanglement and that entanglement entanglement with cancer doesn't just include the person with cancer. It includes their caregiver. It includes their friends. It includes the doctors, right? So this entanglement is really big. And there are moments where you feel like you're like, you can feel the looseness and the freedom of it. And then there are moments where you feel like it's just never, you're never going to get untangled. And, you know, I think it's, I think it's, um, I think it's just part of, it's, it's part of, a, and for me, it's a new lexicon, a new word to think about cancer, because even now, even years after I've had the actual experience with cancer, I'm still entangled with it. In a lot of ways, I don't think I'll ever be unentangled. Um, so I'm going to tell you about myself. Um, this is our family photograph taken in Christmas 2007. My husband was diagnosed with large B-cell lymphoma, lymphoma stage four in August um, 2006. And um, we got this diagnosis and it was, <laughs> I laugh every time I think about it because it was just like it is in the movies with the exception of the doctor came into the room. So my husband, we went to the doctors and there was something in me that told me to go with him. And there was something in him that told me that told him to ask me to go with him. So we go to the doctors. He does an x-ray on my husband who's been complaining about all sorts of different, um, you know, different symptoms. Um, we were on vacation and he was running these mild fevers. So we were giving him ibuprofen and it was working. It would take the fever down. And then he developed this cough. So we were giving him Delsum cough syrup and it worked for a little by, while. And then he was kind of achy in his joints. And and then finally he came home, he, he's, he was an athlete and he went out for a run and he came home much sooner. And he said, I'm having trouble breathing. So I did what every smart wife does. I said, here, take my asthma medicine, right? So we didn't even think to go to the doctor. Well, finally, 
it came down that something we knew something else was going on. We went to the doctor. He does his exam and he comes into the room. Um, he leaves the room after the exam and he comes back into the room and he sits on one side of the the table, the exam table, and he literally laces his fingers together and puts them in front of him. And then he looks directly at my husband and says, I think you have cancer and it looks like it's pretty serious. And the only reason he couldn't confirm is because we needed to do, he needed to do, they needed to do a biopsy. So we kind of go through this moment of shock. We make three phone calls in that moment. Um, Art calls his parents, I call my parents, and, um, and, and Art calls his boss. So we leave the office in shock. We decide we're not going to tell the kids because we don't know anything quite yet. And our kids at the time were four, seven, and nine. Um, and then we made the phone call to Art's boss turned out to be the smartest thing we ever did because Art's boss knew someone at Cedars who knew Dr. Woolen. And I know that many of you know Dr. Woolen. So Dr. Woolen treated my husband the first time he had cancer. So we got in with Dr. Woolen. My husband did the, you know, fight for his life, the rah, 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 really courageous thing. And seven months later, he was cancer free. Um, and what, again, it was sort of another stage because what we didn't understand was cancer free didn't mean cancer worry free, right? We thought that once the cancer would be gone, everything would be great. Um, and there was a lot of side effects that he was dealing with and a lot of, you know, emotional issues of, whoa, what just happened? You know, is this really what I want in my life? There was a lot of, of commotion after the cancer was over. And then unfortunately the cancer came back at the end of 2008. And um, that's why this photo is our last family photo because my husband lost, um, you know, lost his entanglement to cancer in April, 2009. Um, you know, when he was first diagnosed, it became very clear to both of us that his job was to fight the cancer and my job was to manage everything else. And, um, I was really, you know, we were both completely overwhelmed, but I was really overwhelmed by by trying to, you know, manage our children and my job and 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 his, you know, help him manage his 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 cancer and his diagnosis. Um, so I sat down with a friend, I said, I need a list, like I need to come up with a list. I was a I was a, I still am a list maker, and I need you to help me come up with a list of all the things of the help I need. And the list that she came up with was really amazing. So this is our Tower of Tupperware. Um, and this is sort of a fun thing that we did. So one of the things we realized early on is that we don't want to be responsible for anybody's dishes. So when people bring us a meal, they sometimes bring them like in their favorite aunt's dish as a gift. And, and I could not manage trying to keep track of that dish. So we requested that people bring everything in non-returnable containers. And one day we stacked them all up. And just to give you a sense of how tall this, this was, my husband was six foot six tall. And as you can see, it goes to the ceiling. The average ceilings in home is about nine feet. And then on top of it, you can see the second row. So we're guessing there's about 14 feet worth of Tupperware in there. And this was just three months into his, into his cancer entanglement. Um, and there were so many things that people did, you know, meals, obviously, and grocery shopping was very helpful, but giving rides back and forth to the cancer treatment center at Cedar sinai uh, We had a friend who used to drop off flowers at my doorstep every Friday from the farmer's market and leave honey sticks for the kids. We had handymen. I had several handymen come in the house and fix things and do things to help. I had a friend who called and left jokes on the answering machine, on the voicemail and shoe shopping. You know, one time my youngest son was, you know how kids can outgrow their shoes and he outgrow their shoes overnight. And I just couldn't get to the store and I kept trying to get to the store. And finally my friend said, well, I'll go, just tell me what size. And so she went and bought him a whole bunch of shoes in a whole bunch of sizes and she dropped them off when we found the pair that worked. Um, so, you know, the reason there are so many, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of things and ways that people can support you. And what I also want to, I'm not here because I'm super, super strong and courageous or anything else. I am here because of all the actions that people took that helped me get out of bed every day and put sometimes one pinky toe in front of the other. So that's what I really want. That's why, you know, allowing people to help you in whatever way you can is so important. So, 
you know, there are, there are many, many, many reasons why people don't want help. But to me, after talking to many cancer patients and widows and cancer survivors, there's, there were five top reasons that people usually don't ask for or let help in. So here we go. Number one, and not necessarily in this order, is cancer myths. I talked about this earlier. We were all cancer muggles at some point. We didn't understand what it meant to have cancer. And so our view of cancer was sort of this fairy tale thing, right? It was like, you need courage and strength. You get to relax, right? Like I remember someone saying to my husband, you're so lucky, you can now read all the books that you wanna read that didn't take into account of the massive amounts of fatigue that he felt reading was not an option and that people think that you know people associate cancer with being bald and being nausea being nauseous and so that's sort of the fairy tale and 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 you don't realize that you believe this fairy tale until you get into until you become a cancer wizard so to say it's opposite of a cancer muggle and you realize that it's so much deeper than that so sometimes part of the reason of not asking for support support is really understanding that most people are cancer muggles and don't even understand the kind of support that you need because they have this belief system of, you know, that you, what's your problem? You're getting a lot of rest or I know I'll just give you lots of peppermint candy to get rid of your nausea. They don't understand the, the, the depth of it. A second reason that we don't ask for support is the law of reciprocity. And the law of reciprocity simply states if you do for me, I need to somehow give back to you and, you know, pay back. And um, it is, you know, it is why we send thank you notes when people give us gifts. It's why sometimes we feel obligated to, to send, like, you know, the holidays, we feel obligated to give a gift because we don't want to be caught. We don't want to be the person who, who doesn't give it, who doesn't get, get, doesn't give a gift when we have received a gift. Um, it is how, I don't know if you're old enough, but if you're old enough to remember in the 70s, Hare Krishnas used to kind of be in airports and they would give these little pretty flowers out to people. And the idea was, you know, they knew that if they, if you, if they gave you something, you would feel like you needed to give them something back and they would gladly take your dollar. So there's this law of reciprocity. So when you're, when you're dealing with cancer, whether it's a new diagnosis or something you've been living with with years, there's this sense of all if all these people give to me and my family or just to me, I have to keep track of it and I have to pay them back. And nobody wants to be in that kind of debt. No one wants to feel that kind of debt. Now, I will say this, the law of reciprocity from in most cases is actually, we're on the other end of it, which we'll go into a little bit later. All right. Uh, likeability factor. I love this. My goal in life is to be the dog, the person my dog thinks I am. Now, if you don't have a dog, you're kind of missing out a little bit. Um, I grew up with dogs. We had dogs in our marriage. And the best thing about dogs is that you can leave the house and come back five minutes later and they think that it is the best thing in the world. They're like, oh, you're back. I'm so excited. You're back. This is so great. You're back. You're back. You're back. I'm so happy to see you. Right? So there's this sense of a dog loves you so unconditionally. So there's an idea of this likability factor. It is often hard for us to accept the fact that we are likable people because in our heads, we have kept a, le a ledger of all the things that we have done wrong, right? There's that thing that you did 10 years ago. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Not your proudest moment. You never apologize for it. And you're really kind of hoping it will get erased from your memory at some point, right? So we have a list of things that we have done wrong in our lives. And those lists, uh, especially when we, are, we need support, keep us from allowing people to share with us because we don't feel so likable. So how on earth can we allow someone to treat us like we're likable? The fourth reason is on and off needs. And this is particularly true for you guys, for you know the net, net people, um, neuroendocrine tumor society people, because your symptoms come and go. 
You know, some of you have symptoms that have just been kind of consistent. Some of you have symptoms that last for three months. Maybe you have a surgery and all of a sudden those symptoms give you, the surgery gives you great relief and you feel normal again, or, or you feel like you're able to do things again. So it's a little embarrassing. It feels a little embarrassing to say, hey, um, yeah, that grocery shopping you've been doing for me every week for the past month, I don't need it anymore because I'm going to go out and go grocery shopping myself. And then to call them back two months later and say, oh yeah, you know that grocery shipping, grocery shopping that you were doing for me like three months ago that I told you, or two, five months ago that I told you I didn't need, well now I need it again. So, you know, in, in your condition, there's a lot of on off and that can feel maybe embarrassing. Um, you know, it's, you, you're going against, you know, you have, you're going against that cancer fairy tale of what cancer means, right? It's it for everyone else. It's like this long battle and you either win or you lose. And that's sort of the end of it. And, and neuroendocrine tumors are not like that at all. Um, so there's that piece that makes it all hard to, hard to ask for help. Um, and then the last thing is it's overwhelming. You know, it is just simply overwhelming. I remember we, when Art got his first chemo treatment and we were in a hospital, which shall go unnamed because I really disappointed in the way they handled it. Um, but he had his first, um, port put in his hand and they came in the room to deliver him his first round of chemo and I had to leave and I just went into the stairwell and I just cried because I was so overwhelmed by what was happening. And, and I couldn't see how on earth I was gonna manage this whole thing. Meanwhile, you know, um, that night I was sitting with my husband in the hospital and he started to cry because he was equally overwhelmed. He didn't know how he was going to manage, you know, how he was going to manage this whole cancer process. The, the idea of getting rounds and rounds and rounds of chemo, the, the overloading of, of what that meant for his life. You know, he was, he was meant for his manlyhood. You know, he was the major breadwinner in a family, what it meant for him and all those things. So, you know, it's really overwhelming. And then you have all these people knocking on your door, trying to offer you support. And obviously most of them not offering you support in the way that is most helpful. And that way is, as you know, most people say, if you need anything, let me know. And at first, to me, that sounded like great. That's such a great offer because anything is so big. But then I realized it is the least helpful thing to say. And it was the least helpful thing to say, one, because you were asking me or my husband to figure out what anything is. You were asking me and my husband to dissect our lives down into these tiny little pieces to find that one thing that you might be able to do. Anything was just too big. And then let's say I did figure it out. You're asking me to come to you to figure out if it's it, to figure out if it's the anything that you want to do, because Honestly, anything, you know, I know that you really don't mean anything, you know, maybe you're a single person and the idea of going to preschool to pick up my throwing up toddler is not what you had in mind. You were thinking that you would run out and get a gallon of milk. You know, maybe you were thinking that you would come in and read to my, to my mother who was dying. You weren't thinking that you would have to, you know, um, go shoe shopping for my children or go grocery shopping. So now you're leaving it when you say, if you need anything let me know you're leaving up to me to guess what to one figure out what I what I need and two to guess if it's the thing that you will, were willing to do and the third reason it's the least helpful statement to say is because then you put the pressure on the person who needs the help to reach out to you and to risk being rejected and that overwhelm is like no one in their right mind is going to risk being rejected. You know, you need milk and you're not gonna randomly call that random person who said, if you need anything, let me know and say, hey, I need milk like right now because I'm looking at three empty bowls of cereal, I need milk. Um, so that's why it's the least helpful thing to say. And so many of you have probably know that in your gut, but you probably haven't been able to voice why it's the least helpful thing to say. So there you go, and now you can tell your friends. So the overwhelmment of the cancer diagnosis of dealing with all the side effects and the drugs and trying to maintain some semblance of normalcy in your life. Now there is one more that I'm gonna call, it's the honorable mention. And the honorable mention, the honorable mention, the reason that we often don't ask for support, the honorable mention goes to independence because we 
believe in independence. And it is really hard sometimes to accept, to look at it differently. We think that when someone does something for us, it's a handout. And that handout is a loss of pride and dignity, a loss of, it's, it's admitting that you can't do it. Um, it's admitting a failure. So many of us, whether whether we touch into that or not, you know, as as members of the United States, we firmly believe in our ability to be independent and to make these choices and to live the life that we want to live. And we do not want handouts. We don't want someone to do something for us. We believe in earning the right to do the things that we do. And when it comes to cancer, that's true, but it's also not true. All right, so let's talk a little bit about this slide. The reality is this cancer, I'm sorry to tell you all people who have cancer on this call, your cancer is not just about you. It is about the people that you interact with. You are entangled with partners and spouses and children and co-workers and, and, and friends and doctors. This cancer is not just about you. And I will tell you how I discovered this and how I almost lost a friendship over this. So I told you in the beginning about how I called this woman to help me come up with a list of things, of places that I could possibly need help. And so we came up with this big, long list, and then I went through and picked out five things where I was willing to ask help for. And she said, why are you not asking help for everything else? And I said, because I got it. You know, I'm fine. And she said, Kim, you are being really, really selfish. And I was like, my husband's got cancer. I'm trying to do these three kids. You can't call me selfish. I got really upset. And she said, you know, there are a lot of people out here who love your husband, who love you, who love your kids. And when you shut them off, when you tell them that there's nothing that they can do, you are not giving them the opportunity to love you. And that's not fair because in their guts, they feel sick to death to know, or that's a bad term to use. They feel sick to their stomachs that they, that, that art is going through this and they want to do something and you're not giving them that ability. And I was mad. I didn't want to hear it. I thought she was wrong. I sat on it for a few days. I swore I'd never talk to her again, but she's absolutely right. You know, your cancer is not just about you. It's an opportunity to let people feel good about helping you. So please remember that um, and take that in. It may take a, it may take a little bit. So I just also want to take a moment to talk about cancer and caregivers. Um, so I was a caregiver for my husband and you know, there were so many times I did not, I was trying so hard to manage everything so that he didn't have to worry, right? So I wouldn't tell him, I was trying hard not to show him the stress I was under. I was trying hard to, you know, be supportive and not roll my eyes when he was complaining about being nausea and we could just simply take the Zofran, you know, but I was just trying really hard to be that calm wife. And he was trying really hard to not burden me because he could see what it was I was trying to do and what it was I was trying to manage and he could see the stress. And as a result, during the first, uh, his first bout with cancer, we really struggled in our partnership and in our marriage. Um, and especially afterwards, after everything was over, because I didn't see, he didn't let me in and let me know how much he was suffering. He was very, very stoic. And I, you know, as much as we like to think that we're hiding our emotions from somebody, our emotions leak out of us in little ways, right? They leak out of us in comments and snide comments. And so I was leaking throughout this whole time and I wasn't able to say to him, you know, I'm just frustrated and I'm just tired. You know, I wasn't able to get comfort from him. I didn't allow myself to get comfort from him. And had I allowed myself to do that and had he, you know, really talked to me honestly about where he was, it really would have made those first seven months much easier on both of us. 
when he was sick the second time, that is exactly what we did. And, you know, I was able, there were plenty of nights where I cried and he held me because it was just so hard. You know, it was just so hard. And there were plenty of nights that he cried because he felt so bad about the pressure that he was putting on me. Um, and he wanted to be better and he wanted to, you know, to be able to run with the kids again. I mean, you know, so um, being a if you are in a relationship and, and this actually goes for if you know if your sister taking care of a sibling if you're a parent taking care of a child if you know if you're a child taking care of a parent this goes for the same thing you know having that 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 communication is really really important um, and it's something that I really regret I really regret not taking the time to do that the first time that art had cancer so let's just take a breath for a moment because I just kind of rolled out all this stuff, right? I just said, hey, you need to, you know, you're embarrassed because of the cancer myths. You know, you think about your likability factor. You're worried about the pressure you're putting on someone. You're overwhelmed. You know, you want to be independent. And that's a lot to take in. And the reality is accepting help is full of grace. And I'm not talking about, you know, the, the butterfly, the, the ballerina grace. I'm talking about the stumbling forward, crawling sometimes, you know, flat on your face, got to get back up again, grace, right? It's full of that kind of grace. It's full of humility and understanding that, you know, we as humans can only do so much and that it's really good and it's necessary to ask for help. It's full of courage and not that like, I'm gonna beat this cancer courage, not the grit your teeth courage, but it's full of the courage of getting out of bed and putting that one pinky toe in front of the other. Um, and you know, it takes time. I would love to tell you that when I had that conversation with my friend that I took that list and I just simply started calling people and asking for all sorts of help, but it didn't happen that way. I had to slowly get the courage up to ask someone for that help. You know, when the next time someone said, if you need anything, let me know, I would say, actually, I do need something. And um, that took a lot of courage and was very scary. And it just took time. So, of all, you know, working through, remember we talked about that bed of the foundation of all those emotions. You know, it takes time to work through those and and to and to accept them, to let them kind of ebb and flow because they all ebb and flow. Okay, so let's talk about getting to the place of how to accept help. So, like I said, um, I didn't accept help gracefully. Um, I didn't accept help easily, and it took a lot of time. And so, there are a couple things that that so a couple things that looking back that I did, and then I that I talked to um, you know people about doing. And the first thing is you're going to have to show them the way. And I know for many people, it look there. There's a great. Um, Twitter, uh, there's a great company, I guess it's a, a, a it's two women called Thanks Cancer, T-H-A-N-K-S Cancer. They're hysterical. They call cancer the way it is. They talk about how, you know, this morning I got up, I walked to the bathroom and I decided I'm not getting up, I'm not going to spend, I'm not going to get up today, I'm going back to bed. They really talk about cancer the way it is. And one of the things that they talk about is how hard it is to teach others about the journey, right? They, you have to kind of take the cancer muggles and teach them a little bit about the cancer. And there are so many times that you frankly don't feel like it. You don't have the energy and you just don't care. But there are plenty, there are plenty of ways that you can do it without actually being the one who teaches them. So you can send them to Thanks Cancer. There are a ton of videos on YouTube, on, on Instagram, you can follow someone on Instagram, on, on TikTok about what it's like to have cancer, right? They really get into the nitty gritty. You can send them articles about cancer, about the side effects, you know, so you don't have to be the specific person, the person who delivers the news. And also, you don't have to deliver it. You can gather around, you know, your little support circle, and you can have them be the people who who explain the cancer. So it is sort of incumbent upon us 
the, you know, the people who are the cancer wizards to demonstrate, to show people, to help them understand what it's like. And what I did when I, the, finally the way I got over kind of my bitterness, because I was pissed. I didn't want to do it. I was like, you know what? That's their problem. They can figure it out. I don't have time for that. So, you know, but that didn't help me. It didn't help my husband. It didn't help our children. So I had to figure out a way to look at it differently. And the way I looked at it differently is when I shared what it was like for me and for art, then that was giving those people the opportunity to show up for somebody else with cancer in their lives. Because the older we get, the more likely we are going to come upon someone with cancer. And we all know the stats, one in three, one in four, one in three men, one in three women, one in four men are going to have cancer. So we are, by the time we all turn 60, we are all going to know someone who is dealing with cancer. And so my job was to help them show up for that person in 10 years. That's sort of the way that I, that I went about it. So you are going to have to show them the way, but there's some other things you can think about. So I love this circle. This is how to say the right thing to the right person. Something else you can teach them and you can give this to them. Something else you can teach them is this. You're the person with cancer. So the friend with cancer is in the center and all the, all the dumping goes out, right? So you do not want to hear about, um, I'll give you a great example. My, um, my husband died and then six months later, my friend called me up and proceeded to complain and whine about her husband to me. And I stopped her within the first five sentences and I said, I am not the right person to talk to because my husband is dead. And she was like, oh, I, 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 I. so, you know, just re you can tell your friends, complain out, right? Um, and then the second thing you'll see, so there's three concentric circles around the center, and you can look at those as your close, you know, those are people who are close friends, and that could be six of them, that could be two people, that could be part of one of the people, and there could be the caregiver. On the next outside circle, there are the friends, and these are coworkers, you know, these are neighbors, these are people who know you and love you, but really aren't in that close circle. And then outside of that are the persistent acquaintances. And you guys all know you have that persistent acquaintance. It's that person you don't know really well, but they're always want to help. They're like, can I do anything? Can I bring you bread? Can I, can I go grocery shopping for you? Can I change the tires on your car? You know, they're always in there. And there's a lot of value in those persistent acquaintances. People want to help you for various different reasons, right? Some people want to help you, like I said, as a way to give back to you, as a way to give back to your family, as a way to give back to your kids, as a way to give back to you for what you've done and how you've helped them, as a way to show you that, that you, they love you. And other people want to help you as a way to make amends because they did not show up for someone in their lives and they now have the opportunity to show up for you in, in your life. And sometimes those persistent acquaintances are just those people. And sometimes those persistent, persistent acquaintances are the people who you've touched that you have no idea that you've touched. It could be the, the janitor that you smile at every single day when you come into the office and you've touched this person so much that when they hear that you have cancer, they want desperately to help you. So basically don't under, just because you don't know why somebody likes you, you know, why someone thinks you're the best thing since sliced bread doesn't mean that you're not the best thing since sliced bread. So remember that you have value to people around you and all those people want to help. So worry out and comfort in. It's a great circle to remind, to remind people, and this will help them understand better about what, what to talk to you about and what not to talk to you about. All right, so we're going to jump really quick into helping rules. The best thing about the helping rules, any damn rule you want. If you want meals only on Tuesday, you get meals only on Tuesday. If you want to go to the movies every Friday, obviously not during COVID, you get to go to the movies every Friday. You get to change it whatever, whenever you want to whatever you want. It's kind of like being four years old and at a birthday party, your very own birthday party. You get to do whatever you want and it's really exciting and fun. And 
also you get to ask different friends for different things. So, you know, this mom who used to drop flowers off at my doorstep with the six, she, um, our, our kids went to school together. We didn't know each other very well, but we used to always run into each other at the Venice farmer's market. So if you're not here in LA, um, there's a, we have farmer's markets all over the place and there's a special one in Venice. And so I would run into her every Friday at the Venice farmer's market after we dropped our kids off at school. So, you know, we just had a friendly chat. Our kids didn't even, didn't even have play dates together, but she wanted to do something and she knew that I bought flowers. And so that's what she did. And so you can have different circles of friends do different things. And the thing is, you don't have to manage this yourself. Um, you know, I had a lot of, I had three people who were like my point people who sort of like put this protective shield up around my husband and I so that I wasn't always trying to manage the support. So if you have that ability, you can gather those friends and say, hey, I need you guys to be kind of the guards, you know, the, the mouthpieces of, of going out and then delivering information in. So there's a couple of different ways that you can you can you can help. You know, remember that friends are giving to you. Um, find your cheerleaders. Like this is so important. There are people in my life who are useless. They are not good at doing anything. I can't depend upon them for a meal, a ride, even to return my phone calls. They're useless. But what they're really good at is calling up and going, "Go, Kim!" Like I just want to let you know that I love you so much, and you're the bomb. They are the cheerleaders. That's what they do. They're important to have in your life. There are friends, remember their friends are giving to you. Remember that you have control. You do not have to accept anybody's crazy, I, I was gonna say ass, I don't think I can say ass, okay. I don't know. Um, you can just bleep that out if you need to. Um, you know, you don't have to accept everybody's crazy idea. You have control. And remember how it feels to give. And I want you all to go back to that moment. You know, when you have a friend who's in crisis, what does it feel like when you want to help them, right? That feeling of being able to give, to make their day just a little bit better, just a little bit better. It feels so good and so powerful. And that's the gift that you get to give when you accept help. So like, just sit on that for a moment. Just remember that feeling. And now you get to pass that on to somebody else. And that's what I want you to remember. And that's why it's so important that you remember that the cancer is not just about you. You know, it's hard when you're in the middle of this thing where you're fighting for your life, literally fighting for your life. You, you get these kind of, you know, these, these blinders on. Um, you know, you all know the stories. You see pictures of, you know, the woman who's in labor and she asks something for her husband from her husband and she just says, you know, just do it. She loses her mind. Well, when you're in labor, your body is fully focused on giving birth to a child, right? Your whole body, all your muscles, your brain, your body is shutting down and beating and working only to give birth to this child. And so anything that interrupts you from that moment is annoying as all get out. Cancer is the same. You know, Art told me it, there were some days I just really annoyed him because I wanted to talk about whatever. And he was like, I cannot function right now. Like I need to focus, like my whole body is focused on managing all this funky crap that is happening inside my body right now. And so it's in those moments, you can't widen your blinders. But in the moments of peace, in the moments where you're feeling half yourself again, in the moments of, of even sadness, you can open up your blinders and just, re and you can widen your, what are those called? The horses have them? They're, I think they're blinders. Um, you can widen your, your blinders and just remember that, you know, there is, there are people out there who really do want to help you. So now we're going to talk about a plethora of ideas and all the different ways that you can find to help have people support you. So I just want you to take, think back to your normal day. You just woke up, your eyes just opened, and what do you do next? Now, some of you are saying you put your feet on the floor, you grab a coffee, but even before, excuse me, even before you grab a cup of coffee, what we usually do is we go to the bathroom. Okay, so if you're in the bathroom, do you have toilet paper? 
Someone could be bringing you toilet paper. And after you use the bathroom, you wash your hands. Is there soap? Are you out of soap? Are you almost out of soap? And then you've washed your hands, but you need to make sure there's a clean towel. Are your towels clean? Okay, so you go on with your day and you need to put moisturizer on your face. Or, oh, sorry, toothpaste. You're going to brush your teeth. Do you have toothpaste? Have you put moisturizer on your face? Do you need to put makeup on? Right? And then you're going to go and get dressed. Do you have clean clothes? Are you, is your laundry done? Because if you don't, I mean, do you have laundry detergent to do the laundry so you can have the clean clothes and the towel? So you're going to go about your day, you're going to have breakfast. Is there breakfast food in the refrigerator even? Is there clean dishes? Did someone load the dishwasher for you last night and unload it? Do you have dishwashing soap? Right? So let's talk about more. You recycle. Did, did someone take the recycle out for you? Do you need the recycle taken out for you? Do you need to put something out on the on the curb so that so that they and call the garbage people so they can take take it away? Do you need a mop to clean your kitchen floor? Do you need batteries? Because sometimes, you know, that fire alarm thing starts going off and chirping away and you realize you need batteries and you're out of batteries. And then there's the gift for others because you remember that it's Janie's birthday and you have to get her a gift. And then you think, oh my gosh, there's some bills I have to pay. I have to remember to put some of them on auto pay and I haven't done that. So I got to make sure I write some checks for that. And then there's garbage bags because if you take the recycle out, you're going to need to put a new bin in the recycle or take the garbage out. And then of course you have to think about gas because you're going to go in the car because you need to get gas. And then you think, oh my gosh, did I get an oil change recently? And then you realize you probably need to get your windshield wipers changed, but maybe not, but maybe you need to think about it because maybe it's going to happen. And then you realize you need to go to the Staples to get a notebook to write down all these things that you need to do. So if you can walk through your day, you can see all the different ways that people can support you. Um, I wrote a book, which I'll mention at the end, but one of, the, one of my favorite, favorite tips in the book is be is stock her bathroom, right? So be the person as a caregiver or, or someone else who's watching this, you can be the person to make sure that they always have toothpaste and toilet paper and paper towels and, and soap and makeup. Like you could be that person. You could be the person that always makes sure that they have gas in their car when they need to get to their doctor's appointments. You could be the person who calls them up and says, hey, when was the last time your oil was changed? And that's something that my neighbor, Nate, did. And he did this after Art died. Um, my has, Art, Art and I had some jobs that we you know, delineated in our family, and the car was his job. I'm capable, didn't want to do it. So uh, about six months after Art died, my neighbor, Nate, called and said, when was the last time the oil was changed in your car? And I couldn't tell him. I couldn't tell him if the light was on. I couldn't tell him anything. And he said, look, leave me the keys in the mailbox. I know it's LA, but you can still do that kind of thing sometimes. And text me and let me know and I'll come pick up the car and I'll change the oil. And so he took the car, he brought it back and I got in it the next day and I started to cry because not only had he changed the oil in the car, he had filled it with gas and he had it washed inside and out. And what I didn't realize was how heavy just doing those few things was sitting on me. I knew the car needed to get, and he had the windshield wipers replaced. And I knew the car needed to get washed, and I knew that I needed to get gas, and I knew that I needed to, you know, do all the things I needed to do for it, but I just, I was out of energy. I just couldn't do it. There was just no way I could wrap my head around it. And there was no way that if I had thought about it, I would have been able to ask somebody for it, because it just felt, so stupid and insignificant. And so that's the other piece too, is that your friends, your coworkers, your neighbors, they're really good at coming up with different ways to support you that you didn't even think that you needed, just like Nate did for me. And he lifted this huge burden off of me that I was even completely unaware that I had. So let your coworkers, your friends come up with unique and different ways to support you because they will know how they will come up with some really good ideas and keep the ones who have, who've read about that internet solution to cancer away from you because we know that they're out there, but you can keep them at a distance.
So as you can see, there's so many different ways that people can help you. I mean, printing for a printing paper, you know, do you need a new, do, do you need a new computer? What's wearing out in your house? Um, I had to have a light replaced, you know, in the kids, in the kids room and Art was too sick to do it and I wasn't going to mess with electricity. So a friend of mine suggested the handyman. Actually, she suggested the handyman before I had the idea, before I even remembered that I needed to have the light replaced. So there are so many different small little ways. And the small little ways are the ones that really mattered. They're the ones that mattered the most. It, the big things were important, but the ones that mattered the most. Oh, there's pharmacy up there. Okay. So, oh, look at this. I uh, just I forgot all the other ones I added. Pharmacy, lawyer, um, windshield wipers. What else? Shoes, as I mentioned, shoes about my children. So there are a lot of different ways. Your friends, they want to push you. They want to help you get up that hill. And that's where the grace and the ability comes in and says, yes, yes, yes. And that community you build will last for the rest of your life. Um, I am still calling people 11 years after my husband died and telling them, thank you. Because there was times I just didn't, I just didn't remember what they'd done. I was in such a state that I didn't remember what they had done for us when my husband was alive and after he died. Um, so I'm still calling and saying thank you. So remember that, you know, um, it's just really sweet. It's, it's a really good feeling to know that someone did that one small thing that really made a difference that helped me and the kids and Art manage through a really difficult time in our lives. So we went through five common blocks to accepting help. I talked to you about how to accept help and how it's really, you know, it's a mental game of accepting help. And then we talked about the plethora of help that is available to you. And of course, there's other support available to you at all. You know, I believe very much in cancer support groups because there's nothing like being in a room with people who get it, right? You don't have to explain things to them because they fully on get it. Uh, financial support, you know, and make sure that you, that they that you know you reach out to lacnets and use the use the support that they have available okay so now we're going to talk about kids cancer and death um i do want to give a trigger warning in here the last photograph um may be a little bit disturbing so i will pause before i get there and give you an opportunity to turn away from the screen or to you know to ignore this piece of it um, so this is my husband died and our children were 12, nine and seven. And um, actually Art died two weeks or three weeks after my youngest son who was here turned seven. And so one thing that we, we believed in was telling the kids what was going on. And so when Art was first diagnosed with cancer, as you remember, I don't know if you remember, but in the beginning I said, we didn't tell them right away. We wanted to make sure we got a diagnosis. and. Uh, we told them on a Monday when we were pretty sure we knew what it was, although we weren't 100% sure. And so we sat them down in the room and Art and I discussed it. He said he wanted to be to tell them. And so my oldest, who was nine, he took this big chair that we had and he turned it around backwards. So he's, you know, leaning up against the back of the chair. And I'm sitting next to my husband and our our, our then at that point he was four when we first told him a four-year-old was sitting between us and my daughter who was six was on the other side of art and art starts to talk and he says you know i have cancer and he starts to cry and immediately all three kids start to cry i start to cry and we're all crying and then suddenly my oldest his he stops crying his eyes get really big and he gets that kind of questioning look in his in his face and he goes but what's cancer? And, you know, looking back now, it was one of those moments where like, oh, parents, snafu. Because as a parent, we assume that kids have all this information when they don't. Our children had never met anybody with cancer. No one close to them had had cancer. Obviously, they had never heard us talk about somebody with cancer. They had no idea what cancer was about. And every specialist will tell you, you know, when you talk about sex with your children, you're supposed to do it at the age appropriate behavior, but no one tells you exactly what age is appropriate for what. And they definitely don't tell you if it's a topic that's come up before. So we had to backpedal and we had to tell them what cancer was. We didn't mention at the time that he could die. 
And so when he got cancer the second time, it was no big deal for the kids because the kids figured, well, he had cancer once, he'll beat it and he got better. So he'll get cancer again and he'll get better. Um, do I regret not mentioning that he could die to them? No, I don't, because I think it was really important that they had that innocence. Um, and, and the other thing too is children very young don't quite understand death and the permanence of death. Um, so that they will, they can, and we'll ask, is he still dead? When is he coming back? Things like that. So we just decided that we, we, I don't even know if it was a conscious decision. We didn't mention it. Um, so my husband's cancer was getting worse and worse. And we were trying to get him to a point where he could do something called a stem cell transplant. This would be one from a donor. And uh, so I took him to the cancer treatment center on a Friday and I got a call from him on Friday at five and he said, they want to keep me because I'm running a fever. Um, and you know, when you're dealing with chemo, your, your immune system is pretty much shot. So I said, okay. And then Saturday came around. I, we talked a little bit on Friday night and he didn't sound great, but he sounded okay. Saturday came around and I was just too tired. I just could not make another, you know, 45 minute round or another hour and a half drive up to Cedars and back. So I called one of his friends. I said, can you please go up and visit him today? And he went and he came back and he said to me, I don't know, something's not right. You know, he seemed really confused. And he had, um, this friend had bought me back a pair of arts, arts boxers because he had soiled himself. So I said, okay, I'll go up tomorrow morning. And then I got a call um, at around 8 a.m. on Sunday morning saying, we need your permission to do a, a spinal fluid draw from your husband. And I thought that was kind of sort of, they've never called me before for this. And I said, why do you need it? Why don't you ask him? And he said, because he seems really confused. When we ask him if we have permission, he says, he says you know, hello, how are you? So obviously that was a big red flag and I, you know, got the kids settled and immediately drove up to Cedars and I called a friend because I just had a feeling that things weren't going to be okay. And when I got there, Art was barely conscious and he was, um, he was, he said a few words to me, but that was it. That was the last words he said to me. On Sunday night, we had him in the ICU um, and I had a doctor come in and he said to me, you know, what's his code? And I was really unclear about what that meant. And he kept saying to me, what's his code? What's his code? And I said, I need you to speak English. I don't understand what you meant, what you mean. And he said to me, what do you want to do if his heart stops? And that was really when I understood that Art was dying. I knew it in my head, in my um, deep subconscious you know, but there was always this hope that this would just, he would be weak, but we'd nurture him back to help. You know, there was this hope, always this hope. And so I said to him, and I don't know where this came from. Maybe this is the grace that I, that I talk about earlier. I said to him, you need to keep him alive for the kids. So do whatever you need to. The next day, um, Dr. Lin, Dr. Lim, I don't know if any of you know him, came in. So we were no longer being treated by Dr. Wollin the second time around. Dr. Lim came in and he said, look, you know, Art's gonna die. And it's, he's probably got a couple days. He'll probably last maybe till the end of the week because his young and his organs are going to take a little bit longer to shut down. But you, you need to know that he's going to die. Do you want him? Do you want to try to move him home? And it didn't make any sense because trying to arrange for hospice was going to take the number of days that he would take to get him before he died. So I made the calls to friends of ours and let them know what was happening. And I asked uh, two specific friends to pull the kids out of school and to bring them up. I had talked to the heads of both the schools and told them what was happening. So there were a lot of adults around who understood the gravity of the situation. Um, I, my oldest son was the first one to arrive and um, he uh, went into the room and um, I, you know, I said, I, we pulled, I pulled him into the room. And again, I didn't do this by myself. Art's brother was there with me and I sat him down. And I said, Langston, you know, daddy's going to die. Um, the cancer is just too bad for him and to, to get over and his body can't do it anymore. His body just can't keep going anymore. And Langston was in shock. He said, I, I don't know. I didn't think you would tell me this. And, you know, um, so that was the first one. Um, 
And then the second child came in and that was my daughter. And I, oh, sorry. So I went like, I set Langston in the room and I asked if he wanted me to stay with him. And he said, no. So he left, I left um, and I left him in there. Um, I was very, for me, it was really important that I document this. And maybe it's because I felt like I wouldn't remember otherwise. Like I just, so I had a friend of mine who was a photographer and he came in and he documented these last kind of few days with art. Um, and then Palace went in, I told Palace and Palace went into the room by herself, you know, with, with me, she wanted me to stay and she just wailed. She was nine at the time and she just wailed. There was a nurse in there at the time and the nurse had to leave because she broke down in tears. And then Ezra came in and Ezra, like I said, was just seven. And he really had a hard time with Art being sick. Um, at his at his seventh birthday, uh, he said, you know, I just wish that I could have a birthday when daddy wasn't sick. And I thought that was strange because like he's had seven birthdays and Art's only been sick for two, but Ezra only remembers three of them. And so he remembers his fifth birthday, his sixth birthday, and his seventh birthday. And for his fifth and his seventh birthday, Art had cancer. So um, so he had a really hard time with it. Um, wasn't, didn't want to say goodbye and didn't want to talk. You know, sometimes I would use a thing where he would talk through me. So I said, why don't you tell me what you want to tell daddy and I'll tell daddy and daddy can talk to me. So a lot of times we would have those kind of, these kind of three-way conversations and he wasn't able to. Um, but I am really glad that I gave my kids the opportunity to say goodbye. I'm really glad that I gave my kids the opportunity to, to, um, to, to grieve in their own way. Um, so back to the photos really quick. Uh, this is a picture of Ezra with Art's clothes on. As I said, Art was six foot six. And it was around July that I had decided that I was willing to um, take some of his, take some of Art's clothes out of the closet. I was not willing to get rid of them, but I was willing to take them out. And the reason I was willing to take them out is because they stopped smelling like him. I used to get into his closet and sit in there because it just smelled like him and it was comforting. Um, so this is Ezra. This is a great shot of Pallas, um, who used to spend a ton of time in our room talking to Art and telling him stories. And that's her black stuffed lab. And that's Art listening to one of the stories. And this next photograph is the one that might be triggering to some people because this is the photograph of Langston um, in bed, you know, with Art while Art was, you know, a few days before Art died. So please turn away from the screen if you would like not to see it. Um, so this is the picture of, of Langston saying goodbye to Art. Um, so it is, um, you know, death is out there. It's coming for all of us. You know, no one gets out alive as the saying goes. Um, but you know, those sayings are all fine and dandy when you are facing it, when you are looking at it, it is overwhelming and terrifying and uncomfortable and sad. Um, you know, and as a mom, the hardest thing I've ever done and ever had to accept is my complete and total powerlessness in being able to protect my children. So if you are a mom out there who is dealing with, you know, lack nets and looking at, you know, either your mobit, your, your, your demise or your husband's or your partner's or something, um, just know that it's, extremely painful. I would love to say that there's this beautiful rainbow on the other side and there are some really good things, but even today, um, it is still really painful to me that the one thing I couldn't do as a mother was bring their father back. That was the one thing I couldn't do. And it still pains me today to know, of, to know what they missed out on by not having him around as their dad. Um, I will say this though, the thing that really um, makes a big difference is you matter a great deal to a lot of people. Whether you're the one with the cancer, you're the caregiver, you're the friend who wants to support, you know, um, you matter a great deal. And um, 
it's really important that you, or at least I feel it's really important that you let people love you. They want to love you. They want to care for you. They want to, they want to do right by you. They want to make amends to you. They want to show you what you mean to them. And even when you feel like you don't have meaning in your life, that you haven't done good things, letting people in will show you that you have done good things and that there is meaning in your life. Um, a quick word, another quick word about the kids is that, you know, oftentimes kids feel the same way about helping someone with cancer as adults feel. They feel powerless. They feel like they want to do something to make the parent feel better. So if you can find someone who can help them, you know, you can help a, a child cook a meal. You can help them do a play. You can help them do a drawing. You know, um, when Art was sick the second time, the thing that really bugged Ezra the most the first time was that Art went bald and he seemed to have gone bald overnight to Ezra. But really, you know, we just shaved his head and Ezra wasn't part of it, so we didn't understand. So the second time I said, Ezra, do you want to help me shave Art's head, you know, daddy's head? And he was all over it. He loved it. You know, he helped me cut it and he read the buzzer over it. And so for him, that was his way of helping Art, you know, it was his way of also managing the, the fear that he had the first time around. Um, so just remember the kids are out there too and they want to help. You know, teenagers want to share their favorite videos and their favorite favorite TikTok videos and, and YouTube channels, you know, nine-year-olds want to write poems and send cards and four-year-olds want to do drawings. So the kids really want to support somebody with cancer. Um, and it's up to us adults to help them figure out the best ways to do it. Back to the you matter part. You matter. You're so, so, so important. You know, you are here on this earth. And so you're important. It's it's good that you're here. And so please allow people to help you, whether you're the person with cancer or whether you're the, the caregiver to the person with cancer. And if you're the friend or family or coworker who wants to support someone with cancer, keep asking, keep offering specific help and offer more than once. Um, so I really want to thank you all for being here. Um, so on my website, I have a website called 100actsoflove.com and you can download this free thing for you. It has the three things you need to remember to do with someone with cancer. And on the back side, there are five specific things not to say to somebody, why they're not good to say and what to say instead. Um, I have devoted my whole entire life to helping people understand how to be supportive to somebody with cancer. Um, you know, what I saw when my husband was sick was so many people were so hurt and confused and wanted to help and didn't know what to do and didn't know what to say. And you could see the anxiety inside of them. And so I just want them to know that there are so many things and so many different ways that they can take action, that it's good to take action, that it's really helpful to the person with cancer or the caregiver. And we have a very special offer, free of course, Compliments of LACNETs, the first 50 people who finish their survey will get a code and be able to use that code to get a free copy of my book. I will sign it and mail it off to you, um, but it has to be the first 50 people who complete the survey will get that code. So thank you, LACNETs, for, for supporting your community and by doing this, and thank you so much for thinking that my book is worthy enough to do it. For those of you who do miss the opportunity, you can go to my website at 100 love.com and purchase the book, or you can go ahead and buy it on Amazon. Um, lastly, I do offer consulting services. Um, I help put together cancer action plans. It depends on what, you know, it depends on what you need. If you, this is specifically most helpful for people who are just most recently diagnosed when they need to really understand how can people help? What do I need to do? What do I need to think about in my life moving forward? Um, I help set up communities around the Pearson with cancer. So that's available to you and also to employees or managers of organizations. Um, and yeah, follow me on Instagram and Facebook and also Twitter. You can, again, there's my website, you know, please share this message with someone who you think really needs it. If you're a person with cancer, look, you don't have to do anything, but just send them say, look, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but Kim will tell you what to do and what to say. You can send them directly to me. So lastly, here is us in 2007. Um, our old Christmas photo in 2007, and this is us in 2019, Christmas last year. 
So the children now, they do miss their fathers. The thing that someone said to me is when I tell you my husband died, you automatically think about all these little things that he's going to miss, right? High school graduation, college, marriages, grandkids, right? But the kids don't know that. The children don't know about all those life events. And so what's happening now with my children is they get to a point and, you know, high school graduation was a big one for all of them. They suddenly got there and they went, oh, dad's not here. Um, you know, I, and they understand that they didn't really get, really didn't know him. So they want to know him more. Um, but they are doing really, really well. And we are now a really sweet, close unit of four. I have never felt more protected and loved, you know, by, by individuals than I do by my children. So um, while it's not a silver lining, I hate to use that term because it, you know, like, it's like, oh, this is the good side. There is, or this, you know, if you flip it inside out, everything's fine. But there is this beauty and this peace and this love and this connection that is that my children and I have because of the experience that we have been through. Um, and there's this connection I have with my community at large, whether I'm still in touch with them or not, that I have because they were there to support us when we needed them most. So I just want to say, again, you matter so much. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here and spend this time with me. I'm so very appreciative of it. Um, and if you need any help with anything, please feel free to reach out to me. I would be, it would be my honor to support you in any way that I can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, LACNETS, for having me here. I just really appreciate you. All right. You all take care and have a beautiful, beautiful day. You matter. Kim, thank you so much for that beautiful presentation. Um, you know, it's been, what, almost five years since I heard you speak live when we used to be in person. And your words um, and the way you share your story with so, such vulnerability and um, humor <laughs> still really resonate with me. Um, I just really wanted to thank you for that. Um, well, thank you. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's uh, you know, humor is often the only way to approach those hard situations. Um, as, as all your audience probably knows, they're probably sick and tired of people going, oh, you have cancer, right? We don't need another person touching us gently on the shoulder with a great amount of pity. What we need oftentimes is someone to tell us a really bad joke. <laughs> and you've taken your experience and you know, devote, like you said, devoted your life to helping others. So you're really redeeming it and empowering others. And that's what I, is so beautiful. And we just thank you, um, you know, for being able to be on the re recipient end of that. So thank you again. Oh, it's so um, sweet. Thank you. Yeah. So I, you know, I know that we have a range of uh, participants and, and you've addressed so well, um, well, so much, um, but especially, you know, what it is like to uh, go through it with a family. And I know you've touched on many other things. But as we get into the q and A, I I think one thing on people's minds, like, you know, we have young single people uh, uh, ranging to more mature single people. Uh, and of course, in that young families, older uh, families with older children, single, you know, a range of things. But really, there's a lot of people who live alone. So what suggestions do you have for people who live alone? That is such a great point. And every single time I give this talk, that's exactly what comes up is I don't, you know, I live by myself or I don't have a support network. And I think that when you live by yourself, you can provide yourself with a support network and it's going to take a little bit more effort, which is unfortunate. Um, I had a conversation three weeks ago with a woman who was 26 and was just diagnosed with cancer. And she was complaining that her friends just don't get it. And that's sort of that piece where I talked about, you are going to have to sort of show them the way sometimes. And that's burdensome when you don't even know what direction you're supposed to turn to. And I'm hoping that the talk that I gave will allow people to figure out how to, what direction to show um, show their friends through. So, you know, when someone comes to you and says, you know, I really want to help. I feel so bad that you have cancer. What can I do? Feel free to ask for a meal. You know, feel free to say, hey, can you go by the drugstore and pick me up something? Do you mind being on a call for two hours on Friday because I need X, Y, and Z? 
Um, you know, today in the world of COVID, it's actually a lot easier to put together a support network for people who aren't even near you because we have access to Zoom or Google Meet or Google Hangout or all those other options. Um, so that's another thing is, you know, you can now reach out to people who are, you know, not necessarily close to you. And what I found is the most important type of support that that was important to myself and to my husband and to other people I've talked to who have had cancer is the emotional support. So it's being able to reach out to friends and saying, hey, look, I just need you to listen. Um, you know, stating that up front instead of having that expectation. So I just need you to listen. I need to vent a little bit and please don't try to fix it. Like, I just want to talk. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, unfortunately, if you're single, it does mean that you have to put a little extra effort out there to get the support that you need, but it's definitely out there. And I've said it before, support groups are so, are so vital, um, you know, in, in, in so many different ways. And that's another great place to get, you know, some support. Yeah, thank you for addressing it, acknowledging that. It might take a little bit of effort, time. And then, of course, we have the support groups as well. And you kind of touched a little bit on this, um, and especially during the pandemic, right? How can friends and family who live far away help? What kind of suggestions and practical? Advice? Yeah, so I had a friend who um, sent me a card you know, every, I don't know, like every two or three weeks, she would just send me these really funny cards. Um, she lived across the country from us. She lived in North Carolina. Um, I had another friend who would call and leave me a joke on my answering machine. So that was something that was really important to me. Um, we had one friend who put together this fantastic care package for the children. And so if they have kids or they need to be distracted, putting together a care package for kids is a great gift as long as everything in that care package doesn't require parental oversight. Um, another way to help is, you know, share a, share a music list that you've, uh, a music playlist that you've downloaded. Um, Netflix and Hulu now and Disney have watch parties, you know, so call them up and say, hey, I'm gonna watch this movie or what movie, you know, give them a choice of three movies and say, great, let's set a date. So it's really about the time that is most helpful. Another thing we don't often talk about is cash. You know, cancer leads to great amount of financial stress and financial bankruptcy. And if you live far away and you happen to have the ability to send a $100 gift card or a $500 gift card, and you can even do this anonymously, that's the beauty. They don't have to know it's coming from you, so they can't give it back and they don't feel like they need to pay you back. So those are some other great ways that you can support somebody from a distance. Yes. And... How do you um, suggest coordinating the care? What kind of platforms do you use? I know you kind of touch on it in your book a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So I'm a big fan of lots of helping hands because that's what we used. Um, I really, really also love um, Meal Train is another great tool. Sign Up Genius is okay, but it doesn't allow you to communicate outside signing up for this, the one event that you're signing up for. So the, the two that I really prefer are lots of helping hands and meal train because you have the opportunity to communicate back and forth um, with, with, with the people who are supporting you know, from around the world, really. Yeah, thanks for that. And I think that's really helpful. Um, where else... Do you, would you suggest finding support if, you know, I'm someone who doesn't have any friends or family? Yeah, that's, that's a really hard one. Um, so I think, you know, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of, um, and not, not a big proponent, let me restate that. I really like the uh, give now, the donor um, platforms. What I've seen happen very often on them is if you can, you know, some people will just kind of peruse them and want to make anonymous donations. So that's something that you can do. And, and I know it sounds really kind of odd because you're saying, you know, you want to raise $5,000 to take care of your most recent chemo treatment or to pay for rent for the next couple of months or, you know, for whatever reason, and then you put it out there and, you know, you might, you might raise 20 bucks, you know, you might raise a thousand, but in a lot of situations, there are donors who love to give anonymously and, and will do that in those situations. And the nice thing about us is twofold. One is because it, it allows you to get that support. But the other thing is that it feels really good because you don't feel so alone. 
Um, and I think the other thing is to share your diagnosis with people. A lot of people don't want to share their diagnosis because they don't want that oh would would you know the pity thing but if you can get past that pity thing i am constantly amazed at how many people have cancer experience like there you know i cannot open my mouth in a room of five people and share my story and there is at least one person who says my sister had cancer my dad died from cancer you know my neighbor had cancer so those are also you know people who you can talk to so share your cancer diagnosis um, with people at work, with your neighbors. They all want to help you at some level, and that's a great opportunity to, to let them do that for you. Would you mind clarifying what those Give Now platforms are for those who might not be aware? Sure. You know what? I'm thinking of, and I don't know the name, I don't know the names off the top of my head, but it's like, um, uh, I know someone out there is probably in chat right now going, it's da 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 da. Um, it's like donor, donate. <sighs> I'm, I'm going to butcher it. So I can't think of specifically, but it's, it's very much like a Kickstarter campaign, but it's for giving specifically to people who need financial support individually. Great. I think that's helpful. Um, and I think, you know, you kind of touched on that, right? That not wanting to share about this. So what if, you know, I'm someone who feels foolish or uncomfortable asking for help? What would help get over that? Um, that's a really good question. I think what helps get over it is to understand that you you have to have this belief and get to a place where you have that belief where you're not alone. I think one of the biggest issues is that we think that our experience is only our experience and that no one in the world understands exactly how we feel. And that's a fallacy we tell ourselves that allows us to remain isolated. You know, it's like I said, you know, if you told your neighbor that you had cancer, your neighbor is probably, if your neighbor is 40 years old or older, is probably going to go, oh, my dad had cancer, my sister had cancer, my neighbor, someone at work had cancer. Like they're going to have some type of cancer story. And it does, it takes a great amount of bravery, which is hard to come by when you're looking at a diagnosis like you know the the car the like what you guys have and you're looking at this sort of big picture um it feels really isolating but you know people especially now people really want to help and love and support other people they're thirsty for it and so if you can think about it that way you're giving someone an opportunity to show that they care to feel like they're human um you know the there's a i think it's Maya angelou who says the giver benefits from the gift from giving you know like mm -hmm. when you're the giver you're giving when when you let someone give to you you're actually doing a, a mitzvah in a way you're doing them a favor by allowing them to 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 support someone and to get back in touch with that humanity that they can make a difference in somebody's life because that's what we're really all thirsty for right now mm -hmm. Yeah, really good point. I'm so glad that you shared that and that, you you know, your own experience of still being in touch with some of these people 11 years later. Um, I was also thinking about this too, because even over the, this last weekend, I mean, we're six years into our journey. And even over this last weekend, I was um, chatting with someone who was there from the very beginning during the time we were in the hospital and um, serving us afterwards and telling me how it made it such an impact on his life and how it changed things for him. But it's hard for us as the recipient to understand that that could even be possible and to, to yeah. see that, that it would be such yeah, a blessing and, and, when we feel like we're a burden. Exactly, and I think that's the thing. It feels like we're being a burden, but the reality is you're, you're, you have no idea what kind of blessing you are going to be. And you know, I still thank people for everything. that they, There are times I cry remembering what people did for us because it was so sweet and so kind and so thoughtful and it still has the ramifications for me and my children today yeah me too i just tear up thinking of those acts of love that we received as well yeah thank yeah. you for that yeah. so switching gears what if we're on the other side and we're the giver and you know we have a friend who won't accept the help what should i do 
Well, I think first of all is look at those first front slides and just kind of under, try to understand where the person with cancer is coming from. And I think the second thing is, look, a lot of times people won't, won't accept help because we're not specific enough. So if you say to them, I'll do anything, and then you expect them to call you, that's not going to happen because it's just too broad. If you say to them, I am running to Starbucks and would love to bring you a cup of coffee, what would you like? That's more likely to get a response than to be broad. So the more specific you are, the better off. And then I will also say this is you need to repeat the offer. Um, it took me a while to accept some people's offers because I, at first I was just felt so like that's like something I just, I can't accept. But if they offer again, I also know that they're serious. Um, I knew that they were serious and they offer a third time. Now, obviously you don't wanna call them every week and be like, still here, willing to do that thing for you. I gotcha. You know, you don't wanna call them every week, but offer three or four times and then let it go. And if you run into them, have a conversation. And then at the end of them, you can drop in, still happy to go grocery shopping for you one day. Another thing I often suggest is to offer in the moment. So one of my favorite tips in the whole wide world is when you're going to the grocery store, call the person with cancer and say, I am in the grocery store right now, Open your cabinet and tell me what five things are you almost out of. I will drop them at your door. So that's that's like, it's a simple, easy thing to do. The person doesn't feel so much like you're burdening them. It's five things, you know, you're not requiring a grocery list and, and, and you know, with specific, Manufact with specific, you know, items on it. So you, if you can offer something in the moment, you that can usually actually open the door to being more helpful to, to them down the road. Thank you for that. I mean, that's very specific and helpful. I know that that was the case for our, um, for us, both in the beginning and during some of the crisis moments, and even during the pandemic, we have a couple people who say to us, "I'm going to Trader Joe's or Costco, you know, tonight or tomorrow," and they give us a time frame. So let yeah. me know if you need any or what you need from there and I'll drop it off. So exactly, exactly. The yeah, more specific really you are, the more likely they are to accept the help. Okay. Okay. And you know, I know you mentioned some of the things we shouldn't say, like <laughs> the very common, if there's anything I can do for you. So what other right. phrases should I try to avoid saying? Well, I kind of put them in three different buckets. So the first bucket is the help me help you, which is the, if you need anything, let me know. So you're asking, you're, I'm asking you to help, help, to let you help me help you by telling me what you need. Right. So the second bucket I have is the bright side. And that is the, at least, well, at least it's not you know, blank cancer, at least you could live for another 18 years. They're the bright side people. And the word at least is actually diminishes the experience of the person who's dealing with the crisis. So when I say, well, at least you'll look good bald, you know, at least you'll lose weight. It's trying, it, it, it completely puts under the rug all the intense emotions that occur uh, it puts under the rug the fear and the anxiety that I feel as a person with cancer. It just brushes all that aside. And so that doesn't feel very good. And then the last thing I have is the, the I kind of call the, the don't touch this, you know, you can't touch this group. And they're the ones who are like, stay strong, be healthy, think positive. Like their, their statements tend to come in two or three phrases. Um, they're telling you what to do and not giving you any tools on how to do it. They think that dropping that phrase is really helpful because you, you know, uh, think positive. You know, if you think positive, you can beat the cancer, that type of thing. So those are some of uh, general ideas. Um, one thing that I know pisses off every single person with cancer that I've ever met is the, have you tried? And then followed with an ex followed with that great internet cure to cancer that you read about. And look, if you really feel like like something is going to help your friend's cancer, then you need to find out what kind of cancer it is. You need to find out what kind of drugs they're on. You need to do some massive, some deep research into this cure that you've seen. What does it do? What are the side effects? Have people with your friend's cancer had been treated this way. So you need to do your homework and then you can come to them and said, okay, I saw this thing. 
I just, I, I called this doctor. I went to this person. I talked to them. They said it could work. Here's the information. If you'd like to try it, let me know. That's the only time that making a suggestion is really a good thing. Um, you know, you can't offer, are you comfortable with your doctor? That's basically saying, I don't trust that you're doing the right thing. So, so, but I can't say that out loud. So let me just suggest that you see another doctor. Um, so again, it's, you know, those are sort of the big, the big touch points of don't say at least, you know, dropping those kind of bombs of stay strong and stay positive and offering suggestions when you have not been asked and you have not researched them to any length. Um, it's just, those are sort of the general not helpful statements. Yeah. I think I was laughing really hard trying to hold back um, a little bit because we really, I think we all really resonate with that, especially in the NET community, right? And it's the at, the at least comes up even from our physicians or well-meaning people or even from each other because NET tends to be slow growing. So, you know, those with NET of the pancreas might be told, well, at least you don't have the other type of pancreatic cancer. I think everyone has been told that. So we hear right. all those things over and over. And because we hear it, we may tend to perpetuate those things, right? The, at least the be hopefuls and the, you know, the cancer cure things. So um, yeah. stopping that cycle of the, those things yeah. that we, that are not so helpful. Yeah. And there's, so, I mean, there's not a phrase that I talk about that I haven't used myself. I mean, you know, this, <laughs> this, I, you know, I didn't get here because I sang too loud in church. You know, I got here because I said all the wrong things to, to, the, to those people and then my husband got cancer and I was like, oh, now I get it. That wasn't very helpful of me. So, you know, we, we all do this and at least feels really good because we want someone to feel better. We are, you know, the hardest thing about cancer and the hardest thing about telling people with cancer is that we have to get comfortable with with the feelings that come up with it, you know, cancer, death, incurable, um, you know, never the same. There's a lot of emotions in that. And a lot of people can't manage them, including ourselves. And so we will, we'll, we will put a space between the person with cancer and the emotion by saying things like at least. And then, you know, when you say at least it also doesn't give, you know, the person with, with, with the, you know, with the neuroendocrine tumor on their, pancreas doesn't give them an opportunity to go, this sucks, because they then have feel like, well, I shouldn't be sad because I don't have it here, when they have every right to feel sad and anxious and worried and uncomfortable and, and you know, all those emotions. So when you say at least, it really cuts people off from giving them the opportunity to, to feel the way that they feel. There's no right or wrong. It's just the way that they feel. Yeah. It certainly is coming from a place of caring and almost like a way to, you know, tell ourselves as a friend or family member or acquaintance, you know, that, oh, at least it's not this, to try to make myself feel better. better. And that goes back to one of your earlier slides, right? It's not about yeah. me, it's about right. that person. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as you said, we've all said these things. So what if I already said or did some of these things that really are not helpful? <laughs> you know, there is great power in an apology. And there's something, and, and, and it's uncomfortable because you have to admit that you messed up. Um, but what I have found is I have, and I have done this myself, and I have said, you know that thing I said, well, that was really not cool. Here is where I was at. I'm so sorry. I love you. I care about you. And I really want to be here for you. You know, please forgive me. And that's a phrase that is sometimes very hard to utter because it leaves the forgiveness with the person who you have wronged. But it's also a really powerful phrase. And chances are the person with cancer is probably going to go, oh, no big deal. Don't worry about it. I don't even remember it. Even if they do remember it, you know, they're going to let you off the hook. But it really clears the air between you and the person that you've said the wrong thing to um, because it shows that you were thoughtful. It shows that you took some time to kind of go, wait a minute, that wasn't a great thing to say. 
Um, and it shows that you have the courage, like, you know, you care about them so much that you're willing to take the courage to admit that you were wrong and to say that you're sorry and to maybe ask for forgiveness. So it's actually the, the apology itself is, is not where all the power lies. The, the apology, it's, it's the action of the apology that really speaks volumes to your friend, family member, coworker, employee, you know, whoever with cancer, because it just basically says, I'm thinking about you and I'm thinking about your situation and I understand it a little bit better. So it's a really powerful thing to do. And there's no time limit. You can apologize. You know, you can apologize two years later if you want. Um, but, you know, in between those two years, you might still feel really uncomfortable. So I always say apologize as soon as you realize that you've said something wrong because you want to clear that air because you want to be able to show up for them and um, be as helpful as you possibly can. And when you feel bad about something that you've done, sometimes you end up over helping because there's that guilt there that you're trying to get over. So you end up over committing to things that you really have no, you can't, you can't grocery shop for four weeks in a row. You can't. And so you volunteer to do this because you're feeling from this place of guilt because you said the wrong thing. It doesn't feel very good. And all of a sudden you're in, you now have to do this for four weeks in a row and you don't want to do it. So that clean, that cleaning your soul is something that's really important to have a clean relationship with someone who's in crisis or who has cancer. Thank you for that. And, you know, perhaps even an opportunity for deeper connection and, a, a, Absolutely. you know, ability to care for them even better. Okay. Yeah. And I yeah, think we'll, we'll end with this last question, right? I mean, we talked about the things not to say and how to apologize. So what are some helpful things that we could use? I mean, one of the best phrases was someone just stared at me and started to cry and said, I don't know what to say. That was really powerful to me because it showed the level of the, the depth of the news that they had and that they they didn't know what to say, um, that it left them speechless, just as, you know, arts diagnosis left us speechless. Um, so that's a really powerful thing to say. You can absolutely say, I'm sorry. Some people will, will say it's not your fault. And you can say, yeah, but I'm just sorry you're having this experience. Um, there is a phrase. I'm actually going to grab my book because I love this phrase. Um, a rabbi was used it. He was giving a sermon at a 13-year-old um, girl who died um, in a car accident. And one of the most beautiful things that he said and it says, um, you are not alone. I love you. Your pain breaks my heart. So it's not brushing it under the table. It's just letting you know that you're not alone and your pain breaks my heart. I love that. I think that's so beautiful. Um, another thing is get specific. I know you may not need this right now, but if you need your piano moved, let me know. And that sounds like a really funny, you know, really funny comment and it may bring some laughter, um, you know, but offer specific help. You know, do you want me to take your kids on Friday night? I know that you must be shocked with this. Can I pick up your mother from the airport? Is she coming in? So sometimes even going right in the specifics and then just, just the honest, the good old, like I said before, I'm so sorry. Like, I'm so sorry this is happening to you. I love you. You know, those are just powerful, powerful phrases. I think the piece is don't try to fix it. You can't fix it. There's no fixing it. It's not in your power to fix it. It's not your business to fix it. So don't try to fix it. Just sit with it, feel that hurt and that pain and express it in a way that, that feels right to you, that doesn't put the pressure on them to comfort you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Just allowing, you know, the permission not to fix it. And then also this very specific things, we all want to help. So um, I know, and, and you mentioned this, you know, um, being very specific, I know when my twin sister was was coordinating our care um, when we were in crisis and in the hospital, she got so she was overwhelmed by all the offers to help, all the you know, let me know what I can do. That she basically then turned around and said, "Tell me what you can do. <laughs> Tell me right. what you're willing Good for to." Her. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, that that is the, that is the key thing. Tell me what you can do. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Well, this has been a really helpful time. We've gotten comments in saying how the suggestions were really um, helpful 
very um, that, that people loved your suggestions, that they just really enjoyed the way you are. And I know I do, um, and I've gotten so much out of this. <laughs> I treasure my book, and I love that you wrote this on um, October 14, 2016. Lisa, That's you matter. so touches my heart. <laughs> Let your friends show you how much. So um, <laughs> thank you for this, and thank you for all you do for you know, taking your pain and your experience and devoting your life to help others, to help you know, ease that a li just a little bit for us. And um, just thank you. Yeah, well, I think that's the thing is, you know, we often feel like we need to come in and swoop in and make everything right. And, you know, I'm not here because I was so strong and seven people helped me do everything. You know, I'm here because someone sent me a massage place gift certificate one month, three months in a row, you know, anonymous. I'm here because someone took, picked my kids up one Friday afternoon after school and kept them till Saturday evening. You know, I'm here because people went up to, to, you know, read to art while he was getting chemo treatments. You know, I'm here because that friend who left jokes on my, on my answering machine and those small little things matter so so much and they um yeah that that's it they just matter and i just want people to know you know if you have cancer you are so important to so many people you have no idea um but let them in they want to help you they want to love you and it will be one of the most incredible experiences of your life and if you're the person who wants to help someone with cancer keep asking be specific and keep asking because they need you and you need them so um, thank you so much, Lisa, for having me. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful to be able to, you know, carry this message. I'm super, super passionate about it. I would do this all day, every day if I could. Um, and so, yeah, thank you so much for allowing me to be here. I'm just honored. Thank you for your wisdom and kindness. And um, we look forward to hearing more from you. Um, I'll let you take it away, Lindsay. Back to you at the studio, Rich. Thank you, Lisa. As a reminder, be sure you're following LACNETS on social media. We have a Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Stay up to date on upcoming webinars and net news. As a reminder, today's webinar is being recorded and can be viewed on our YouTube channel shortly after the live broadcast. We understand these are challenging times, and we offer many programs and resources, including our weekly net support group, monthly net caregiver support group, net vitals, which is a downloadable patient-physician communication tool, to help you prepare for your medical appointments and health coaching available to both patients or caregivers. We encourage you to go to our website to find out more information about our programs, view resources, read blogs, take net quizzes to check your understanding of the information you're learning and much, much more. We have many exciting upcoming webinars. In February, net dietitian Tara Wyan will be joining us from across the pond from the UK to discuss nutrition and neuroendocrine cancer. She's well versed in net nutrition. In March, net expert Dr. Delphasan will be talking about some novel agents, copper 64 dotatate, which is an imaging agent, and targeted alpha therapy, or in other words, alpha PRRT. Please save the date for Saturday, June 19th. This will be our virtual 2021 Los Angeles Net Patient Education Conference. And last but not least, as you know, LACNETS is offering our programs at no cost to the community. We are also offering a special gift today, a complimentary copy of Kim Hamer's book for the first 50 people who watch today's webinar and complete the survey that you'll receive after today's program. You must have registered in advance for today's webinar in order to receive the link for the survey. After you complete the survey, you'll receive a special code that you can then enter on Kim Hamer's website, 100actsoflove.com, in order to receive your free copy of Kim's book that she will sign and mail to you so that you too can pay it forward with acts of love to show others that they matter. Thanks again to our speaker, Kim Hamer, Rich from TVP Live, and all of you for joining us today. See you on February 16th for our next webinar. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you.